Kinder. His English is so much better than my Russian, but all of his books are still in Russian. Uh, I have I've been told that he's reproduced those particular kinds of experiments almost 5,000 times in his, lab, in his uh, laboratories. He's now um, interested in dowsing, and that's his passion at this time. And he is out um, performing the engineers dowsing for mineral deposits in Russia. Cleve Baxter. I'm, I'm imagining everybody, maybe not by name, but has heard of Cleve. The uh, plant guy? That's um, his recent book. Interesting little book. It's all in your handouts if, if you don't get it all down. Cleve was the guy back in the 60s. And uh, do we know Cleve? Sorry. Yeah. He's, he is the grandfather, if you will, of lie detectors. But uh, in the early days of lie detection, if you can imagine, um, I, I don't want to be sexist, but a bunch of male pigs in a research laboratory, and it was a dirty place. And they were goofing off at times, and they had the lie detector equipment hooked up to the, to the laboratory plant, which was sitting on the desk next to the sink, which was filthy and growing stuff fuzzy things. Sometimes stuff would crawl up out of the sink. And they, I made that part up. But they decided that, that they were going to clean out the sink one time. They took a pot of boiling water from the uh, coffee maker and dumped it in the sink, killing all the, the growing stuff. And at that moment, the lie detector went crazy, hooked up to the plant. The uh, Yeah. No, Dracaena. I think. I wasn't there. Uh, so kind of as a sideline, they set up this series of experiments. They would do things like have a person come into the room with the intent of harming that plant, and the plant would react. Or with the thought of hurting another person, and the plant would react. And they went as far, now this was not their, this was a sideline. They, they had contracts, they had stuff to do, but they kind of dabbled. One of the uh, most elegant experiments they did was set up a pot of boiling water above which was suspended a beaker of baby shrimp. And this was all on a random kind of timer device that sometime in the middle of the night when all the cleaning staff's gone, the entire building is vacant, that beaker was going to tilt and the baby shrimp were going to be boiled to death in the water, and all of this was being monitored by some device. And again, random, so nobody knew when that would occur. They would come back and analyze the data the next day, and at the moment the beaker of shrimp hit the boiling water, the plant reacts. Interesting things, and another interesting one, in one of the more recent ones. Now, Cleve describes uh, the Dracaena day as the day that forever changed his life. He went on and did lie detector, but now he's doing this kind of stuff. In uh, a few years ago, took a guy who happened to have been a gunner at Pearl Harbor, World, uh, at Pearl Harbor at the attack. And they're showing this guy, he's hooked up, I'm sorry, let me backtrack slightly, they extracted white blood cells from this gentleman, cultured white blood cells. So now they have a test tube full of his white blood cells. Now they have the gentleman and his white blood cells hooked up to the equipment. And they're showing him videos of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And as the camera pans to him at the gunnery site, of course, all of his vitals react. And at that exact same moment, so does his white blood cells seven miles away. Replicated, so last I heard from Cleve, replicated to 20 miles. Interesting. Something's happening there. There is communication, and uh, it evidently can at least go 20 miles. We're going to find out a little bit later. It goes, we know it can go further. 
Fritz Albert Popp, somebody mentioned Fritz Albert earlier. Fritz Albert did um, an interesting little discovery that led him down a little different path. And that was that all carcinogenic compounds absorb light at specifically uh, 380 nanometers. So things that cause cancer absorb light at that specific frequency. And he postulated that possibly that frequency of light is somehow essential for the body to, be, to cure itself or keep itself healthy from cancer and set up a collection of experiments. Interesting phenomenon, strong blasts of UV light can destroy cells, but what they've also found is that the same wavelength at very weak intensities, and it heals faster. Again, the theory is that somehow these visible light waves are an essential part of the healing mechanism. And Fritz Albert thought about the, the uh, uh, I said that already. So he did something interesting. He had a guy named uh, Bernard Ruth design and build for him a, photo, a biophoto multiplier. So how many, uh, who's been in a cave when they turn off the lights? You ever been in a cave when they shut off the lights? And it is creepy dark, right? And if we go to the middle of the night, and pull all the curtains, close your eyes, you're still getting a couple of stray photons are bouncing around. The human eye is exquisitely sensitive. Uh, the human eye actually registers up to one photon, as little as one photon of light. So that's not much. So what he did was develop, or had a guy develop a photomultiplier so that he could measure very, very, very tiny amounts of light and found some crazy chick in Germany. This was in Germany at the time. And I'm just saying she had to be crazy because she spent six hours a day in a cave for nine months. And for those of you who have been in a cave that shut off the lights, it's, it's uh, uh, I'd, I'd go berserk. But she's hooked up to this photo multiplier, and guess what? People emit visible light, actual measurable photons of light. Did everybody know that? I'm talking to the wrong audience. I'm being too slow here. Okay, so who puts out more light, healthy or sick? Who? No, sorry. Sick. Because what, what they found what in his further research he found that the, the light, the photons of light, specific visible light, these specific wavelengths, are being emitted when DNA strands unwind. So cellular de uh, destruction and repair. We will also see that they've measured, uh, so it's somehow with the DNA, et cetera. Uh, let's see if I have those specifics here. I think I have them a little later. And we'll see that organisms such as people emit a little less light Plants lit, uh, emit a little more, sick people kick out more, etc. A couple other guys, these guys, Schwartz and Kreeth, they did uh, fluorescent photographs. Um, so these were, as it says, five hour exposures and by a little different, different methodology and measured or actually uh, demonstrated that plants also emit light. Ah, Froelich. This was the first guy to, I don't know if he was the first guy, but whatever this resource was claimed that he was the first guy to actually uh, hypothesize that bodies produce these little vibrations and these little vibrations in turn then uh, go throughout the body coordinating function and are somehow absolutely essential for health, healing, and so on. And went on to think that this is the foundational, functional, energetic system of the body. Um, and as I sort of alluded to before, this kind of research was becoming popular, was demonstrating some really interesting things, 
right about the time molecular biology started catching on and somehow that's where the research money went, that's where the glitz was. Uh, I guess it was more tangible for some, I don't know why, but that's where the research went. And, and as a whole, we kind of went down that little um, pathway. Yeah, here's the parameters that Fritz eventually found. About a, a rudimentary small, like uh, 100 photons per square centimeter per second in that vicinity. So that's the range of the bioemissions that, that uh, Fritz Albert found. And that people kick out about 10. That's 10 per square centimeter per second. And people demonstrated biological rhythms at 7, 14, 32, 80, and 270 days, which was at the end of the research where he had that one person for nine months. I don't know if I have a slide about this further down the road or not, but he did something else really interesting. He did several interesting experiments during this nine months, one of which was he had a group of healers. And this group of healers were going to do a healing on this lady at some time on a given night. Now there's a six hour window. They don't tell him when, he has no clue. They're a different part of Europe. They're going to do this at their own choosing and then uh, let him know at some later time, a couple of days later, they inform him of when they did it and then they correlate the data. And measurable changes in the biophoton emissions when these healers worked on the lady in the cave, probably for um, insanity from the dark. It's scary in there. So also hypothesizing that somehow these faint radiations, these energetic communications are at the root of, of healing. Fritz Albert was originally um, thinking he was looking for a cure to cancer. But as his research developed, he looked into some other things, but basically he also did find that cancer patients lost their natural periodic rhythms and the coherency of their emissions, that somehow they were out of sync, out of phase, etc. Candace Pert, Molecules of Emotion, anybody? Going once, going twice. Um, brilliant lady. Interesting talking to her. I didn't talk to her. Uh, lecture that she was giving. Uh, she describes herself as a recovering reductionist. She's got a little ways to go, but one of the things that she, uh, that she mentioned, and this is fascinating, Here, this is current science. They can measure the production, the moment of production of certain neurotransmitters in the brain. They also know for some reason, I'm not sure why, but they know that, it's, that these neurotransmitters uh, move through the cerebral spinal fluid. That sort of helps uh, boost the concepts, the energetic concepts of chiropractic, that the uh, healing energy flows to the nervous system and cerebral spinal fluid. Somehow they know that, but here's the clincher that they can't figure out. They can measure the moment